Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation on children's literature in a time of crisis. Uh, we're delighted to have you all with us for this dialogue with Jason Reynolds, Laurel Snyder, and Samantha Berger. And we are grateful to partner once again with Air Serenby, the Artist Residency Program in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia, to bring you this conversation. And yes, the two cottages behind me are the rural studio cottages where the artists at Air Serenby live uh, when they are in residence. Capita started in 2018 as a creative space to explore how the great cultural and social transformations of our day affect young children and foster new ideas to ensure a future in which children and their families flourish. We are grateful to the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance and Hills and Hamlets Bookstore for their support as well. Hills and Hamlets has curated a selection of these authors' books to complement today's conversation. A link was included in the email earlier today if you pre-registered, and we have shared it on our website, capitasocial.org slash live. We encourage you to support this wonderful sponsor, an independent bookstore based in Serenby. I want to acknowledge as we start that we are having this conversation on the 30th annual day of the African child. We stand in solidarity with the African Union which calls this annual commemoration in remembering the 16th of June, 1976 student uprising in Soweto, South Africa. On that day, 10,000 students marched in protest against the poor quality of education they received and, to, and demanded to be taught in their own languages. The day of the African child serves to commemorate these children and the brave action they took in defense of their rights. This day thus celebrates the children of Africa and calls um, for serious introspection and commitment towards addressing the numerous challenges facing children across the African continent and of African descent around the world. And now to introduce our guests. Jason Reynolds is the New York Times bestselling author, National Book Award finalist, and Library of Congress's National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Jason was the 2018 Mulberry Street Focus Fellow at Air Serenby, an award given to an artist whose work explores the experience of childhood and growing up. Jason, thank you for being with us. Laurel Snyder is the author of six novels for children, two books of poetry, many picture books, and is a regular contributor of essays and commentary to a diverse array of publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and NPR's All Things Considered. Laurel was the 2017 Mulberry Street Focus Fellow at Air Serenby. Laurel, thank you for being with us. And Samantha Berger is the award-winning author of over 85 books for young readers, including Krankenstein, What If, and Rock What You Got. She is also a twice Emmy-nominated television writer. Samantha was the editorial director and vice president of animated shorts for Nickelodeon for over a decade. She currently writes for Sesame Street in Communities and Sesame Street International. Samantha Berger was the 2019 Joy of Reading Focus Fellow at Air Serenby, an award given to an artist whose work celebrates diversity and inspires kindness, laughter, and the love of reading. Samantha. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We are living in a time of crisis from the COVID-19 epidemic and the economic devastation it has wrought around the world to the centuries long epidemic of violence against black people, most recently made visible once again by the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and Rayshard Brooks. In an accelerating conflict between China and the United States, one in seven adults worldwide or some 750 million people on the planet struggle to food, food, afford food and shelter. As of this morning, 434,796 people worldwide have died of the coronavirus. And according to the latest data from UNICEF, nearly 31 million children have been forcibly displaced either as refugees or within their own country. So here is my first question our panelists. What comes next? And this is not intended to be an invitation to prognostication 
but to help us understand what is next for each one of us and for our children. And Jason, if I could start with you. <laughs> um, this feels like a setup, man. It's like, you're like, let me tell you how bad the world is. Jason, what do you think we should do? You know, Look, here's the thing. I, uh, what comes next is the question that, that you asked. And the truth of the matter is, is uh, one of the beautiful things about, about life, uh, if we can sort of suss out and mind where the beauty is these days, but one of the beautiful things about life is that it, um, is that it continues. And, and because it continues, we have a, a perpetual, well of possibility and opportunity because children continue to exist, right? And so I think about the world that we live in and I think about the irreverence of young people and the irreverence of young people makes me happy because if we live in a world where young people aren't irreverent then the world will never grow. So right now, what I see, like as, as we look at this sort of global, you know, this sort of global dumpster fire, right? All, all I can really think about is the fact that at the forefront of all those movements is some 17 year old, yeah. right? There's, there's, there's a bunch of young people between the ages of 14 and 25 who are on the front lines of every single one of those movements, whether it be immigration and refugee uh, and the refugee crisis, uh, whether it be uh, um, uh, the earth and, and the environmental crisis, whether it be the racial crisis, uh, which is obviously perennial in America, or um, and and even and even when I think about um, things like COVID, right? I think I, it's still something that I think young people are are sort of pushing. And we can argue about sort of well, young people aren't wearing masks, or young people aren't doing this, or young people aren't doing that. And what we and what but what we fail to realize is that there are there's millions of young people who graduated from high school. Um, in a year where they weren't allowed to graduate and that year will then mark their lives in an interesting way. And so, and so think about the fact that in 2000, which is when I graduated from high school, we were dealing with Y2K, right? So like that, that year from 99 to 2000, the entire world was scared to death because of Y2K. Everybody thought that because we were entering into a new millennium, that, that, that our computer systems and technology wouldn't be able to reset itself. And so all the banks would be wiped clean. My mom filled the bathtub with water for some strange reason on New Year's Eve. All this stuff was sort of going on, right? And what it ended up doing was it propelled a generation, my generation, right? That year, 2000. So if, you're, if you graduated from high school in 99 or 2000 or 2001, it propelled us to be the people to invent all the technology that we use now in terms of social media and all these other things to ensure that the next time we're faced with something like Y2K, we will be better prepared, right? So my thing is, when I think about COVID, just knowing what I know about my own self and my own generation, why would we think that perhaps 10 years from now, the kids who did not have a graduation and a prom and all of this because of, a, because of an illness or because of a pandemic wouldn't be the people to ensure pandemics never happened again? To, to me, that just makes sense, right? And so I guess my answer is what's next? What's next is, is it's not about what's next, it's about who's next. And I think that's the conversation that needs to be had, right? That's, that's all I care about, right? Who's next? And the answer is young folks, if you're not turning to the kids, you're missing the point to me. Great, thank you, Jason. Samantha, can we go to you with that question? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with, uh, with Jason on that. I think that uh, everybody who's coming up today, and, and I talk to younger kids, like a lot of my stuff for Sesame Street, um, I'll write stuff, you know, to kids who are living in Syrian refugee territories, you know, or um, kids who, uh, you know, you need to give them, um, any kind of hope right now in a time of, uh, you know, not being able to connect with people. Um, and so when you're talking to the littlest kids, preschoolers and picture book age kids, um, you know, you, it's your, as long as we're here, as long as we wake up every day, as long as we're alive, as long as we keep ourselves healthy and, and grounded and breathing and strong and, in solidarity with one another, then there's hope to do better and make a better future, a kinder, smarter future tomorrow. And so, you know, as an old person, I'm talking down, to, I'm talking to those kids and I'm trying to raise them up to 
remember things like every day, like your words matter, like every word you choose, choose for a reason with purpose, with care, every, every, everything you are, you matter. You know, every, every single person here matters. I, uh, everybody should just make that one shift at, at like three years old that there's nobody who's better than you and there's nobody who's less than you. Like that, that shift, that mind shift, and I remind myself this like every day is like a very, very strong message to go into the world with. So I feel like I want to treat the children, the youngest children of the world, like they're all my children and pass down those messages of love and of kindness. And then that's going to be the future that we create. That's gonna be the future that they create. It's gonna be, it, it has to be the future. So that's what I believe. And Laurel, what's next? <laughs> Um, no, it's funny what Jason was saying. My, my kid, my older son went to school the last day before school shut down in a mask. And his teacher sent me an email in the middle of the day and was like, Moses won't take off this mask. He doesn't need this mask. He needs to not wear this mask. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, he thinks he needs that mask. And like, nobody's shown me any science that suggests that he doesn't need the mask. And then, you know, of course, weeks later, when it all became clear that they had only been suppressing the information that we needed masks to conserve the masks, my son was like, ha, cannot wait to go back to school and tell her that I needed that mask. That like they, they so, the, so the part of it is that they need to know, like they need to be empowered in the ways that we're talking about. But the other part is we need to get out of their way, right? Like we need to create the space for them to do that work. And one of the things that I keep, yeah, I mean, we all, we're, I think, I've been going in this loop forever now where I'm like, oh, everything's terrible. And then I take a minute and then I'm like, well, wait, everything was already terrible, right? Like, like things were already terrible. People were already hungry, people were already dying, people were already not getting hospital care. People already don't have a roof over their head. Like that was all already true. It's just hitting a lot of us in ways that we're not used to it hitting us. And so I feel like we had this, it's like the iceberg thing, right? We had we have the ice under the water that we're not seeing. And now we're looking at a little bit of ice above the water and our kids are saying, there's all this ice down there. Um, and, and I guess my question is like, what do we need to do? Not, not like what's next, but what, what do we need to do next to make sure that when our kids have ideas or wanna lead the charge or wanna take it to the street, that we support them and we get behind them. Because I think sometimes, particularly in the education community, like. I think sometimes like we want to empower them until they make a mess. And then we're like, well, no, 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 come back and sit down. You know, like that was messy. Um, it's gonna be messy. And, and I think that's where I'm curious to see where this leads is like, we need to restructure education. We need to restructure all sorts of things in society right now. And, and this is all revealing that. So I'm, I'm sort of upset, but I'm also really excited. Laurel, I, I want to follow up with you on, on, on that point. And a couple of weeks ago, you posted on your blog this question. Uh, how do we make sustainable change in our own white habits? And I'm just curious for you to, to building on what you've just said, go deeper with that as we think about the need to restructure education, the need to provide tools and resources to our young people, to, to who, particularly those who are white, to restructure uh, their habits and and to I mean, make I think a sustainable not, change over the course of generations. It's not unlikely of the election cycle, right? We get excited and upset about something when it's right in front of our faces and we make all these promises that we're going to work on that later. And then something else gets in the way and we get distracted and we forget what we, what we said right before the election was going to be really important. Um, so I guess in our personal lives, for me, that the question that I'm asking myself is what can I do now while I'm freaked out to remind later Laurel that she meant to do this thing, right? Like, what, what can I put in my Google calendar once a week that reminds me to shop at black owned businesses or to, you know, make a regular donation to bail funds or to volunteer some time at my local Title I school or like whatever this, like whatever the thing is that we're trying to correct for. Obviously, like there's a million places to put our energy right now, but it's gonna be really easy later to settle back into comfort. Like as soon as, as soon as, as soon as we're not uncomfortable, it's going to be really easy to, to sort of pat ourselves on the back for carrying a sign. And so that's, I, that's my question is like, I mean, the, I threw the, the things that I was throwing out on the blog were just like, 
you know, set your reading for your book club. I mean, people have been making fun of book clubs, but books matter, right? Book clubs matter. And that's like a market force that, that drives dollars, that drives what kinds of books publishers acquire next year, that, you know, like there's all kinds of things that get implemented that way. So yeah, like choosing now that we're gonna read all books by women of color in the next year, if all the book clubs at all the bookstores around the country did that would have a huge impact on what publishing looks like five years from now, I would think. You know, so things like that, where like, what can we do now so that we have to walk the walk later? Jason, I want to bring you in here because Laurel's blog post where she asked that question was in response to something that she had heard uh, you say, I believe, right, Laurel? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so Jason, I want to bring you into the uh -oh. conversation. That could be no, it was, it was the talk you <laughs> Build on that. I could be idiot me. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? You said that white people needed to talk to white people. And I had been feeling and I had been feeling nervous about using my voice. And honestly, I, I was nervous about coming to this today and like taking up space in this way. Mm. Um, but when you and Brendan were talking and saying that like, I mean, obviously we all we all know like this is a white people problem, but sometimes I think we're too timid about getting out there and risking making a mistake. Yeah. And so it was sort of like, well, the choices are I can sit back and not make a mistake. Or I can say something. I mean, I think and probably I think, make a mistake. <laughs> and make, yeah, and, and sure. I mean, I think I think that there's. I think we're in an interesting time. I think there's some hard questions that have to be asked, right? Um, I think the the hardest question is: Are the things that we are doing, and by we I mean white people, are the things that white people are doing right now in this time, are they being done to uh, in an effort to absolve themselves of guilt? Um, because, uh, which, which by the way, is a human thing, um, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an honest question, right? Because if so, then it's unsustainable. Um, it's unsustainable, right? Like the, I, I, first of all, my therapist told me one time, because every now and then she gets it right, you know? And, and she, she was saying to me just a couple of years ago, she said, you know, there's a difference between shame and guilt. And we conflate, we conflate those words. We conflate the definitions. And she said, you know, guilt is often about something you've done, but shame is about, about, about who you are. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and that I think there are so many people who feel so much shame right now, and it just isn't helpful. <laughs> um, like it's not helpful, right? And so ultimately, I think that the moments of guilt have to be fleeting. They have to be passing so that we can continue to move forward. But, but white folks gotta ask themselves, am I doing this because I truly want to see a systemic change? Because what, we, because what, what, what no one ever wants to talk about is that that systemic change may come at a cost, right? And so it's easy for us to you know, do this or do like, I wanna go to the protest. I want to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence to be more thoughtful about where I'm putting my dollars, all of which are really, really important, especially in the capitalist country. Um, but there's that other part of the conversation that says love is sacrifice, mm -hmm. love is risk. And, and, and so the hard question that I think a lot of my white brothers and sisters are gonna have to ask themselves is what are you willing to risk? Uh, and that's a complicated question. It's tough, self-interest drives us. That's human, right? Self-interest drives us. So what exactly is the self-interest here? And, 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 and if there's nothing for you to gain, then you're definitely, that means you're literally putting yourself up against loss. And it's what is going to make for a more equitable world, but it's a really difficult conversation to have with people who feel like they don't, it's like, it's not my fault. It's, it's not, I didn't do it. I didn't cause it. I didn't, I think about the same thing as a man, right? And this is what I always try to tell my, my partners who are white. I'm a male. I have a certain kind of privilege as a male. In this industry, I have a certain kind of privilege as a male. Um, and, and, and not only do I have a privilege, but deep in my body, deep in my consciousness, there is misogyny. And everybody is so terrified to admit it. But the truth is, is that it's dangerous to not admit it. It's dangerous to disassociate yourself with the most egregious amongst us, right? Because what happens once you disassociate yourself is you will let yourself off the hook and then you become a weapon. And that's a problem. So I'd rather stick as close as possible to the men who I know are dangerous and harmful, associate myself with the worst of us in order to constantly be deconstructing the things about myself that I may not even always know, but I know that the country has created a, a, an incubator of my, for, for my misogyny, whether I know it, misogyny is like a mist, right? I don't always see it, I don't always smell it, but it's all over me. 
And I got to be conscious of that in order to undo it, you know? Well, and it, it goes back to the guilt and shame thing that you were talking about, that something you have done that you apologize. I mean, I remember as a kid, my mom would say like, you're not a bad person, you did a bad thing. Like that was the language, right? Like you did a bad thing, apologize, make it right, move on. That like guilt is something you can let go of. Shame is not. So it's like easy, shame you right? can't like, let go. And if you, if, you, if you own the thing you did, and, and actually that same talk that you and Brendan did that, that I wrote that blog post in response to, there was another interesting moment in the talk that I really took something away from, which is that you were asked what mistakes you had made in All American Boys, and you both immediately were like, oh yeah, we failed utterly. Like you, you owned the, you said, we're sorry for the thing we did. And then kind of like, okay, next question. Like you can't move forward if you can't let go. Right. I wish I could change it. I can't change it, but I cannot do it again. I can atone, right? Because that's the other thing is that saying you're sorry means nothing, right? Atonement is what we're talking about. And, but atonement only comes when there's correct, correction of action. If there's no corrective, no corrective moment, then, then apologies don't mean anything, right? And, so, and I think that's, the, that's sort of where, where we all are. And so in terms of what you can do, look, I think we all got to find where our front lines are right now. For you, that's where your front line is. You know that because the other thing, Laurel, and, I, and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm happy that you're like, look, I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to put my money here. I'm going to do this thing and this thing. And I'm glad that there are things that are, that are manageable things because what's also going to happen is everybody is diving into the pool, enthusiastic, reactionary, right? And what's going to end up happening is they're going to cause more harm, mm -hmm. right? Be be because, because of the immaturity that that comes with the excitement of trying to make change we see kids do it all the time we see this is a thing that humans do it's like i want to be a better i want to be better so now you know all of our religious all of our religious institutions you see it the most if you have a person who has never who converts to whatever religion it's like i'm going a thousand miles yeah. an hour right and then there's a moment where it's like all right this is unsustainable right. Let me, let me let me figure out what works best for me, right? And I think I'm 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 like everybody who wants to do right, all the well-intentioned folk out here who really want to do better and do right. I'm with it. Let's take baby steps, please. <laughs> so let's read some books. Let's buy some books. Let's let's volunteer at the schools. Let's let's convince ourselves that black people aren't dangerous. Let's let's like like simple things. You nobody. Get, you, I don't need you to join the board of the NAACP because you you know what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> so, so Samantha, I want to bring you into the conversation here around what what are the baby steps you're thinking about taking, particularly with your work and and in the industry. Okay, well, a lot of my steps are baby steps. I'm really slow, <laughs> but um. No, I think that uh, those things are so valid. I think uh, anybody who knows me has heard me say like so many times, one of the biggest side effects of being human is being human, right? You make a lot of mistakes. You make a lot of missteps. You fall on your face. You have Zoom sessions and you got like a big snot. Nobody tells you. You may, you have to like be like, okay, I'm, I'm a human being. And so that's a side effect. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, but as a human being, like maybe possibly my strongest asset is that I have the ability to change every day, right? I have the ability to evolve a little bit every day. That's like, that's like trying to, to work with what the best you have to work with, right? Which is like a big mantra I try to live by. So a lot of us beat ourselves up like crazy after we make mistakes. I've done it. Uh, <laughs> one of the healers that I love, Tara Brock, she talks a lot about the double arrow. The first arrow is when you do the bad thing, right? Then we sometimes give ourselves like a second arrow to beat ourselves up about it for a really, really long time. Well, it turns out the first arrow was enough. You're already bleeding. So just like take a minute, reflect, think about how it could be better, how you could have done better. What little thing could you do right now? What little tiny three things could you do every day? And then take that action, actually like go through with it, like hold yourself accountable. Um, so I feel like last night uh, I attended this uh, poetry vigil, right? Jason was a part of it. Uh, a poet I love my whole life, Aja Monet, was hosting it. She's 
incredible. Everybody should know her work. Um, the other 11 poets who spoke, I didn't know any of their work. I didn't know any of them. And I was like, these people are incredible. These people are amazing. I'm gonna write this down. I'm gonna tweet this out. I'm gonna say, no, you know, know these people. That's a little thing. That's not a, that's not a big thing. I'm gonna support them. I'm gonna buy their books. I, I'm, I donated to the thing. I, I, I do feel like there's more I can do all the time. I am very like clear that I have walked around in this skin my whole life and I could always do more. I don't want thanks for that. I don't want congratulations. I don't want applause for that. I saw that talk with Brandon also and I was like, right. I don't need to be like, oh, you did such a good thing. Look at you, you did a good thing. I don't, I don't need that. I just need to like make sure that I personally act, right? And, and I personally like can be a little bit better every day that I'm, I have the gift of being here. Great, thank you, Samantha. Uh, I'm gonna take this moment just to remind folks that if you have questions for our panelists, please uh, tweet them to us at capita underscore social. Uh, you can also to tag us on Twitter. You can also uh, offer them in the YouTube uh, chat box and, and we'll get them that way too. And I also wanna make a plug here for Hills and Hamlet's bookstore. Uh, they have a curated selection working together with these authors. They have a, put together a curated selection of books um, and, and we will share that link as well. Laurel, I want to turn back to you here on, and, and really the question is, I have to say that so far, our conversation, I think, has been grounded, it's been practical, it's giving uh, me hope. Uh, and yet, I think in so many ways in our world, hope is elusive. And, and so I want to ask you, first of all, what's giving you hope uh, in, in these days? What is the source of your hope? But also, um, I'm feeling, frankly, not quite so hopeful in, about the world that we're gonna leave behind mm -hmm. for our children. And so uh, what, what's the message that you would give to young people, to your readers about hope in the future uh, in this moment? I might be the wrong person for that one. Um, so, so part of my answer is that I'm Jewish and we have a long tradition of despair and hope, right? Like we have a long tradition of like, the expectation is that someone's coming and knocking on the door. And also you gotta get tomorrow anyway, right? Like, and and that's sort of like those ideas, the ideas of like my requirements, like my sort of what I'm required to do in terms of sort of repairing the world and social justice and being a decent human being. And the fact that bad things are gonna happen all the time. Like that those things just go together. And, and so I, I don't, I think sometimes, and I run into this actually in writing for children too, that I write books where I'm told that the, the book was not positive enough or not hopeful enough or not cheerful enough that, that sort of all middle grade novels are supposed to like be like something sad and terrible happens. And at the end we're hopeful, right? Like that's, that's the arc. And narrative is really just all about where you start the story and where you end the story, right? So if we ended it a few days later or a few days before, it wouldn't be so hopeful. Right, like everybody's life goes up and down in that way. And I feel like I've been having maybe a hard time with the like cheery cell right now. Like I kind of feel like there are times where you say to your kids, and I'd say this as a parent, not as an author, but like, no, it's really, really dark and bad. Like, and the only way it gets less dark and less bad is if we do something about that. Like, right, that's our, that's our part to play. We have to, we have to produce that and sometimes getting kids to see their role in improving things depends on them seeing how dark it is. And, and, and I'm struggling with that a little bit right now myself in terms of like, I think we spend a lot of time telling kids that everything works out okay in the end. And a lot of kids know that's not true, um, just naturally and unfortunately. Um, so, so it's this balance of like, there's hopefulness. So hope, hope is about what's down the road that you can't see yet, right? And then there's like the frustrating, sad thing that's already happened. And maybe action and activity and like change are the present, are like where the work gets done. Um, but I'm struggling, like I'm struggling with, with 
not with how to do that for my own kids or like with the kids in my sphere. I feel like I can communicate that in a human way. I'm struggling sometimes with how that fits into the forms of children's writing that like, we don't get to have tragedies and, and tragedies exist and kids learn from tragedy. You know, that when oh, I was- I'm just, kid, I'm just curious as somebody who's not in that industry, where do you feel like that pressure comes from for there always to be a, a positive ending? I mean, I think that there's, I don't know, that's a big, that's a big conversation. I think that, I think that, I think that adventure and humor -y and sort of cheerful books sell. And there are people out there who are looking for other things, but that in general, that's the sense is that sort of like, we wanna, we wanna pretend, like we wanna create a world in this literature that feels safe um, because we can't control the experience that kid might have with it if we're not standing right by them or something. But that's always bothered me. I feel like kids have more control over a book than anything else. And so if, you, if, you, if a kid picks up a book and it's too scary or too sad or too nihilistic or too dark, they can set that book down again. They can be in control of that. They can come back to it. They can skip parts. They can go to the end and see what happens. You know, they, they have a certain amount of power with a book that they don't have necessarily in other parts of their lives. And so I always wish, I, I wish sometimes we could push a little, a little bit further with that, that um, there's like something that happens where like they get to high school and now they're allowed to have dark books, but, but like up until a certain point, it's like they don't know what it is to be sad or angry until they are 15. And then they can be all sad and angry all the time. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. But so maybe I'm, I guess what I'm saying is maybe I'm the wrong person for this question right now. I feel like it's- Well, time. everyone's gonna get the questions. Okay, I feel like it's time for kids right now. A lot of kids need to be taking a hard look at some of the things that are difficult in the world. So that as Jason was saying, like they're gonna be the, the leaders of the next generation. And I'm not sure that tying things up with a bow and saying like, and they all lived happily ever after. Sometimes it feels like that gets in the way of activating them. So now to you, Samantha, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. And, and in particular, the, do you feel the same pressure for the happy ending? <laughs> um, let's see. I think that um, when you're talking to really little kids, like when you're talking to three-year-olds and luckily like, and, and, and I'm Jewish too, but, uh, but <laughs> so we love to play games like top my trauma. It's really <laughs> a lot of fun. Uh, there's uh, I really, um, I do believe that the littlest minds, the littlest hands, the littlest brains in our universe, they do need, they do need those connective tissues of hope um, and love and reassurance that um, they are loved. There is nothing wrong with them. You are three years old. You've been on this planet for three years. You're good. You're good. <laughs> Everything about you is good. Um, the hard one for me still to this day, is that you're taught things your whole life, like the golden rule, like do unto others as you would have others do unto you, right? And then you get into this situation where you actually realize there's no such thing as fair. And that message is so hard. It's so hard for me to this very day. So like I wrote a a, a book about it, like a, a poem about it, uh, about how you could never tell a little one, there's no such thing as fair, that good people die and, and, and they didn't do anything wrong and, and, and nobody deserves it. And you know, no one will ever publish that book. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm talking <laughs> But I needed to write that book for myself because Unfair stuff happens every day and there is no such thing as fair and it's so wrong and it hurts my heart so much. Uh, and it's like a betrayal, it's so, sort of a betrayal of things that I'm telling a preschooler who, you know, is in a part of the world where they don't have clean water, where that's the number one killer of kids is not having clean water, like tons of kids. And I like, it's hard to tell those kids that um, 
everything's going to be okay when you know it's not. But I do believe like having that candle always flickering in your heart and holding that love alive in your heart is that's my message to bring to people while I'm here. Like I know it is. Jason, bringing you into this, this conversation, your thoughts on, on hope, um, things working out to be okay. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in that perspective um, right now, as we are particularly children, young people of color are seeing such images, um, devastating images, murderous images uh, in the press. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I mean, first and foremost, in terms of hope, so I'm hopeful. Even in, in the midst of all the nonsense, I'm hopeful. Uh, and I'm hopeful because um, for a few reasons. Number one, if there were no one in the street, I'd be less hopeful, right? The fact that people care makes me hopeful. Hope doesn't equate to perfection. Hope doesn't even always equate to a fix, um, right? It doesn't, it, 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 uh, for me, hope is about process. It's about, it's about the fact that people care. It's, it's literally human moments that remind me that human beings are still inherently good. I do believe that, right? Like the three-year-old, nothing is wrong with the three-year-old, right? <laughs> human beings inherently are good. Uh, and I think the fact that there's been such an outcry and an outpouring of, of change and anger, a righteous rage, that's hopeful for me. The other thing is technology um, in all of its, uh, in the midst of all of its complexity and double-edgedness um, also gives me a bit of hope because the truth of the matter is, and this is, this is sort of insider baseball a bit, but you know, Samantha and Laurel, you know, if the publishing industry is forced to interact through, let's say Zoom, right? What happens is it immediately becomes democratized. And suddenly all the push for diversity becomes really, really possible because an editor could live in St. Louis and an agent could live on a reservation in Arizona and, uh, and um, maybe a, a salesperson could live, could be a, could be a Mexican American in California, right? If, 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 and, I, and I've been thinking about this a lot because I do think something may happen, but there's something about figuring out how to democratize the back end of what we do. And not just what we do, but a lot of things are gonna become democratized in an interesting way. Uh, and I'm fascinated and that makes me hopeful because what that looks like on the back end in terms of the pr production of books and literature and, the, and the, the, the specific work that we are doing, um, it actually moves the needle in a way that we have yet to be able to move it. It moves it in a, in a it expedites the movement of said needle. Um, so I'm hopeful, like I'm, I'm I, I, I don't know if I could not be hopeful because then I just would be bummed out all the time and I just can't, I can't do it. Like I need to, I, like even if it's naive, I have to convince myself to believe that people care. Um, and, and, and I don't care about it because for me, all I care about is the body politic, right? Like I ain't worried about what's happening up top, all the talking heads and all of that. I'm not interested. That's the reason I chose to work for kids. I don't, all of this happening up here, I ain't worried about it. I'm going to put my attention and my, and my energy to where I know there, there are hope sponges, right? I can't, I can't break down that wall. I'm not interested. I don't have the energy for it. What I, but it's a lot easier to tell a six year old that, that, that she, she actually can change the world. And the truth is it's not a lie. Even if it feels like a lie, we say it out of our mouths. The truth of the matter is I'm not sure it is. Can I, can I say something though? Like, I feel like I don't mean to suggest that I'm not hopeful. Like as an individual, I'm hopeful because I have to be, because otherwise why would I get up in the morning and do the things I do, right? I'm hopeful. I think what I was trying to communicate was that I feel like there's been a sunniness in children's literature, in a lot of spaces in children's literature, sort of cheerfulness yeah. that it's not that there's not hope. It's, it's like, it's a yes and. It's like, I am hopeful and like, there's a lot of work to do. And in order to show kids how much it's it's not like be hopeful, like like there's work to do. It's like be hopeful, look at all the work you have to do. Like, like oh, I'm with you. Both, it's both of those things. You need this hope to carry you through the work, but you also have to be able to stare clearly at what it is we're dealing with. And I sometimes feel like people really, really 
restrict what kids, and I'm not talking about a three-year-old, but like the, the, they restrict what, what they give kids access to in terms of, and, I, and I'm, I'm speaking very much from like a middle-class white experience of like, there's this illusion that like some kids don't need to know about gender identity or some kids don't need to know about race or some kids don't need to know about, you know, terrible history of the South. <laughs> like, that like, no, kids, as, as they get older, kids all appropriately need to know about all of these things because they are going to be the ones that have to go out and deal with this to some degree. And I agree. And I just feel like when I like, I only have charge of two children like that live mm. in this house with me. And I feel like, Sometimes I worry I cross that line with them of like, they're more anxious about the coronavirus than a lot of their friends are. They're, they're keeping social distance because um, they really understand what's going on. But I don't know, like, I feel like sometimes we take care of children's feelings by concealing the truth. And that, that bothers me. But you know, you know, what's fascinating about it. Cause first of all, I agree with you a thousand percent, but what I find most fascinating is uh, oftentimes black children aren't given that same luxury. So like, so it's interesting, okay. right? So like for me it, on my side of the industry and the work that I'm doing, uh, uh, it is almost like, if you're gonna write a happy book, you might as well kiss your career goodbye. Because, because for some reason in the minds of the masses, black children aren't allowed to just be regular. They're not allowed to just have, you know, Lamar Giles wrote a book called The Last Last Day of Summer. I yeah. think it's genius. And it's just about black kids having fun on the last day of summer, going on this weird sort of magical adventure. And why isn't it massive? It should be a huge book. It's yep. not a series, but and it, it should be huge. But 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 I could write ghost about a book, a boy whose father tries to murder him, right? And it becomes one of the biggest books in the country, right? Now, but now do I think, why did I write the book? Because it happened, it's, it's, a, it's a true story, right? So like I wrote the book because it's something that I, that I know. Um, uh, but, why couldn't I have written the last last day? Of, does the last last day of summer work for me, right? Does it does does the last last day of summer become a massive book if it's written by one of our white homeboys, right? If it's written by Adam Gidwitz, it becomes the biggest book on earth. Yep. Right? It's interesting to think about it that way. And so, like, I mean, John, Joe, I mean, Joe, Joe asked, "What is it like to, for black kids to have to see images of death?" Right? And the truth is, is that black children, a lot of myself when I was younger, images of death was something that we saw. Because, because if we didn't, if, if our parents did, look, we can go back to, to my mother having to see Black Death with Emmett Till. We can go back to my, my, my cousins having to see Black Death with Dr. King. This constant sort of, sort of reminder that, 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 that there is a target, that for some reason you are prey, right? Without ever, without ever telling the predator that he or she or they are predators. And so we have to carry the weight and the brunt and the burden of trauma. And it's, and it's normalized in our communities. Yeah. as like, this is just what it means to be a black kid growing up in America. You got to deal and carry that weight. It got to live in your body so that you're able to survive another day. That's sort of the, the expectation when the reality is I deserve an opportunity to be a nerd and to, and to play, to write Lamar Giles books. Like, why not? Why well, not? And, then, and then there's this other thing, which is that, so, so you've created a window onto one very specific black moment, right? And then a bunch of white people are going to come look in that window. Yep. And and, 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 pity me. and yeah, and and create this very limited understanding. Yeah, which That's is which is why Lamar's books are super important. Varian's yes. books, Tracy's books, and like They're all super important. Renee Watson. I tell people all the time, like I don't, we don't. Uh, I don't look if you if you empathy is what I'm always after. Sympathy only serves the ego of the sympathizer. I'm not interested, right? But what happens is all these books get brought up, and then and then all these teachers whom I love and whom are doing the best they can, teachers and librarians. The moment a black kid in their class is like, I don't have nothing to read, they say, I know exactly what you'd like. When the reality is, they may have liked Harry Potter. Yeah. Maybe not right now because she's <laughs> maybe not at the moment. But they may like Lamar Giles. They may have liked the Last Last Day of Summer. Like, it's just a weird, it's a strange thing to live in a world where you're hyper visible and absolutely invisible. And once you actually are seen, they only see you as the carrier of a backpack of trauma mm -hmm. and nothing else, right? I literally symbolize trauma. And the truth is I'm full of joy and hope and intellect and curiosity. And all people see is 
but there had to be something in your life that really almost took you out of here. Was your mama on drugs? Did you grow up in the projects? Did you ever a long way down? It does not say this kid lives in the projects. And every single radio show host says, it's about a young man growing up in the projects. Every single apartment building is not a project. But that's, it's, it's, it's the way we go. It's the way it works, right? And these are the things, we talk about racism. This is what I'm talking about. Like, mm -hmm. I ain't worried about nobody calling me the N word. It don't happen. People ain't, work, people ain't willing to take the risk, right? That's not a thing for me, right? People just, it, it's too much of a risk to call a person my size the, the N word, right? That, it never happens, right? What does happen though, is they say he writes for black kids and, I'm ex and, and they expect to see trauma stories. Mm -hmm. That is so important. That's so important. That's just such an important point. I would love to see the Jason Reynolds Joy book. Oh, I, look, I would. As brave I as you, would. I, I think that the book As Brave As You is a book that is le less, it's a lesser read of my books. And I think it's, I think it's a beautiful story. The book Lou, if you read Lou at the end of the track series, there's no, there's no trauma in it. Right? He's a kid who's trying to figure out what to do about the fact that he's about to have a sibling and he never thought he would. You know, like, like there's, I, th I think I, I try to, I think I'm not, and I'm not interested in avoiding pain, by the way, because my life is, has been full of it. What I'm interested in is writing whole people. That's all. It's okay for there to be trauma, but there's no one's life that's just pain. And so there's a way for us to write children as whole people, because that's what they are, a world amongst themselves where there's good and it look both ways is full of joy. It's full of joy. And some of those stories are pretty painful because that's life. Both things can be true, you know? You know, it's funny. I just saw somebody post the other day on Facebook about, there was like a, you know, it was one of these little Facebook groups for like authors sharing whatever. And um, somebody was asking like, what do we think the publishing world is going to do with the pandemic? Like, are kids going to want to read? Like, basically like, how do I sell my pandemic? How do I sell my pandemic story? And and so there was this conversation going about like, sort of, will we see coronavirus in picture books, in middle grade novels, in young adult, and like, how will it be positioned? And there was a big argument, somebody was making a big argument that like, we'll just want to forget this. That like, mm -hmm. that like, somehow we would be able to conveniently lift this two and a half year window <laughs> out of history, you know? And then like, we can just like go back to normal. But, but I think the, there's, there's actually an argument for that. Right, and that there's the for example, I mean, and, and you've heard this talked about over the last several months that the 1918 Spanish flu does not show up, right? And and literature, and, and some people have said have speculated that I've heard that this is because we were very disappointed in how we responded mm. to the 1918 Spanish flu. It's something that we wanted to forget, and that the stories we tend to remember. Um, and I think this is a, an interesting point about memory. Of course, we, we are selective rememberers. We want to remember the things that we are proud of. And, That's and weird, though. So, so go ahead, Jason. That's weird. We, I mean, we, 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 we've written about Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Ad nauseum. And yeah, but most, of the people, that one. <laughs> but most of the people who write literature about Vietnam are doing it with a critical eye. Like, there are people who would have, who, who would have been protesters, right? Like... You don't see a lot of like glorious Vietnam fiction. That's true. I mean, but I think we could do the same, right? I, I personally think we go the route of Germany, which is like Germany teaches Nazi, they, they teach Nazi history starting in kindergarten and they yep. teach it all the way up. And I think it would be, I, look, I'm not writing any coronavirus stories personally. Uh, I just, I don't think I got it in me, but I do think they should exist. Uh, and I do think they should exist critically uh, because, I, because I'd like to believe we'll never have another one of these in our lifetimes. But they'd be nice if it does happen to have something to look at, right? I, I have a situation where I was working on a book that has to be set in February of 2020 because it's her bat mitzvah date and it's linked to a particular piece of Bible. And so it has to be like that spring. And so I've been working on it. And then this all started and I was like, ah, like the end of my book just disintegrated. The end of your book is in the I house. can't send my time traveler home now. <laughs> Samantha, I want to I want to bring you in here just just on the question of your work with with Syrian refugees, right? And thinking about all of the themes that we've discussed today in terms of hope and trauma and pity, and and the lives of of the Syrian refugees for whom you are you are writing and, and doing work. Just help us reflect reflect on that in light of some of what we've already heard in the conversation today. 
Okay, so this is, a, I guess, a good example because the Sesame Street stuff, and they're also like doing a COVID response, right, is for, for um, really young kids, right? Pre-K always is like, oh, let me reform my brain pre-K, right? So before five, right? Before five, okay. And so then it's like, well, these are really, really, um, as Big Bird would say, I'm having some really big feelings, right? <laughs> let's break it down. Let's try to put words to those big feelings. Let's, let's try to see like, well, how do we feel actually? Like, what are the words? Are they afraid? Are they courage? Are they worried? Are they nervous? Like when you don't have the vocabulary yet to put to it, you try to help draw out the words, find the words, and then help find like any kind of comfort, right? There's, they do an incredible job of um, inventing Muppets, new Muppets. Um, like I worked on the, I feel so lucky to have worked on the campaign for foster care and for, um, the first Muppet who doesn't know a permanent home. And you know what it did? It like, it shift, I will never say the word homeless again, because when you say that somebody's homeless versus someone who doesn't have a permanent home, you immediately see the shift to empathy and compassion. Homeless is often, unfortunately, used synonymously with scary or uh, dangerous um, or, you know, someone to be feared. Someone came over to me and they were homeless, right? But what you're really saying is someone who doesn't have a home with safe walls on all the sides came up to me, approached me. That is a very, very different word choice in just one word, right? So, I guess uh, thinking like you're always talking to somebody who's three, um, for me is really helpful. It helps reframe the conversation and think about my words more carefully. Um, and that always brings me back to a place of hope, which is like that, that lives deeply. So no matter where a child is, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what, trauma they're dealing with and like we have all kinds of ways of identifying and defining trauma now i do feel like it's our job to bring them that moment that that plant that seed it's more than a moment it's planting a seed that grows into a beautiful beautiful flower of hope of, of you're good enough of that like you, we're gonna make this world a better place. Like I got your back. You don't walk alone. I'm standing right next to you. All the things I wish I could hear, <laughs> that's what I try to bring to them. So one of our questions from our, from our listeners today is, are you able to write right now? Given the distractions, uh, given what is going on in the world, are you able to write right now? And if so, how? And whoever would like to go first. I'm, I'm writing. And, and, you know, I'm always writing. At the end of the day, it's like, for me, um, is it easy? No, but it never is. I can't tell how much of this is just my own writing patterns or how much of this is like me being sort of COVID you know, exhausted from COVID. Writers, it's it's our, it's a weird thing to do in general, right? It's such an internal, strange thing to sort of sit at the computer or sit at your notepad and figure out how to make up some strange story that feels good to you or painful to you or whatever it is. And so there are good days and there are bad days. And during this whole quarantine, there have been good days and there have been bad days. But I will say this, I I try to be faithful to the process. I show up every day personally for me, uh, partially because of the craft of it all and partially because um, I suffer from clinical anxiety and I got to put it somewhere. And if I don't put it here, I'm going to put it somewhere else uh, and it gets and it could get bad for me. And I know that about myself. So 
you know, it's about sort of managing your triggers and, 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 and your symptoms. And for me, this is, a, this is a safer place to put that stuff. Whether, it, whether it's ever published or not is of little importance, um, but I got to sort of pay in every day. It's like, it's no different than any other meditation, you know? There's a, there's a line about inspiration is for amateurs. Mm -hmm. Professionals just show up to work every day. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I was supposed to be working on a novel uh, that I have, was not able to keep working on this bar mitzvah thing was just too early. We canceled my son's bar mitzvah and like, it was just the wrong project for that moment. Um, and then one day I woke up and found myself working on something brand new. So for the first month of the quarantine, I was working on a prequel to Orphan Island, um, that I had sworn I would never write. <laughs> and something about this experience, I was like, I just want to go live in a little island again. <laughs> like, I just want to go hide somewhere in a beautiful place. And so I sort of hid myself in a beautiful place for a month and then sent pages to my agent. And um, I haven't really been able to kind of get myself reorganized since then. Uh, but I've been working on poems for the first time in like a decade. It's like the first like grown up poems. It's there's something about this experience that like, like, I'm like, just like as an adult person and mom, I can't deal with my own life. I have to put my anxiety somewhere. And so I find myself writing all these things that I'll never publish. Like they're not what I'm supposed to be working on and I'm not gonna get paid for them. But I just, I have feelings and I gotta put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. And one of my illustrators once, uh, Emily Hughes once said something to me where she said, when we were kids, when you were kids, you drew or wrote to get something out. Like just that, that natural instinct to just like wanna splatter your feelings. Um, and as an adult, you develop a different kind of practice. And I, that's what it feels like to me right now. It feels like I'm writing things out and maybe years from now, I'll know what to do with them. But right now it just feels like a mess. I can't, not, not, nothing I'm writing is useful professionally. Samantha? I have to write every day. That's all I do. That's all I'm meant to do. <laughs> Some of the stuff is like passion stuff because like, I, it's just, it's a practice. It's a daily practice. I got to get, I got to get it out still like a kid, <laughs> like Laurel just said, like, I still got to get that stuff out. Sometimes it's like, um, it passionate and, and I'll be shaking when I write it. Some people got to see that recently. And then all of a sudden I got to switch to writing for Sesame street on a deadline. And I seriously, the scripts get written out loud. So like my poor neighbors, but like you're here in your house and you're like in a state, right? Cause you've just seen something that's so upsetting in the world. You're just like in this state, but then you have this thing you have to do. And you literally <laughs> are like, hello everybody. And seriously go do it. <laughs> cause that's you have to do. <laughs> I want to hear what your neighbors are saying on the other side of that wall. <laughs> like, and do they ever respond? <laughs> I hope not. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> I would love to live next door to you. That sounds great. <laughs> that sounds great. And my friend's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, that's just Samantha. She's, you know. Like, how many people are in there? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it's, it's a few people in there, you know what I mean? By in there, I mean in, like, in there, right? Like that. <laughs> That's scary at all. We have, we have uh, one more question from a member of our audience today, and, and I want to make sure we ask it. Uh, what do you think of white authors writing novels with Black main characters in which their race is inconsequential to the plot? And this person is asking specifically about, or is specifically thinking of Ban This Book by Alan Grotz. So what, a, a white person writing a, a, a black, a character outside of their race. So a person of color where the race is inconsequential. That is how the question's formulated. And I, I admit, I don't know the book, so. Um, I didn't read it. I know the book, but I didn't read it. Have you read it, Laurel? I've read it. You got you got an answer? <laughs> I <sighs> This is one of those moments I'm gonna look back at and be like, why did I say that? You, um, you, you can all pass. No, no, you know what? I'll, I'll, just... I'll, I'll say this. I think, I mean. I have no authority on this. I, I feel strongly that um, it's what we were talking about before. You, 
sometimes you're going to make a mistake and you're going to get called out for it. And then you're going to say, I should have done that or I should have done better, or I will try harder next time and try to learn from that and keep moving forward, right? I remember talking with Justina Ireland years ago when I was working on the Charlie and Mouse books before they came out, the illustrator was looking at doing something different with the characters visually. And, um, and, and I was struggling with like, I wrote this book about my two little white boys. The characters are not gonna be little white boys. Mm -hmm. um, it, what role did I play in this? Like what, what, what responsibility do I have to call this out and say like, maybe we should not be just painting these characters brown, you know, like the sort of what's my role in all this. And I was talking to Justina about it. And there was in particular one line that I really felt we needed to change if, if these characters were gonna be black. And, um, and Justina was like, you know what? She's like, sometimes she's like, I don't think anything you've done here in this text is wrong or whatever. And I, I hope I'm not putting words in her mouth, but basically she was like, you're gonna try and you're gonna screw it up. And like, sometimes you're gonna screw up. You're gonna, you're gonna try to like, it wouldn't be right to not be inclusive and have people of color in your books. So you're gonna try to do that and you're gonna do it badly and somebody's gonna call you out. And like, that's sort of, that's part of the process is like, that's how we grow. Like that's how this gets better basically on some level or something, something like that. But so I, I feel like I've been thinking about this like ever since then of like, do I wanna, do I wanna like make my books like white as snow because I don't want to risk having done anything wrong um or do I want to try to be as inclusive in, as, as possible but but like but be writing characters that I don't know from my own lived experience like the sort of and then and then I hear other white authors say well then we can't win and the answer is like well no then we can't win then like we can't win because we have this missing chunk of our lives there's a piece of my lived experience that is not up to this task and I've got to fi find the book I can write authentically, right? Um, and be prepared to make some mistakes along the way. Um, so, so in answer to the question, I, I felt that that book, I, Alan is a friend of mine and I like and admire him as a writer. That book was one where I did feel like it was inconsequential and just kind of layered on. Yeah, he's one of my- There was a detail, there was a detail about the character sucking on her braids. Yeah. Like, and, and I remember I, I reached out to a friend of mine and was like, is this like, and she was like, yeah, your mom wouldn't let you do that. Like, that's not like, there was just something wrong about the moment that just felt like there are those details, the texture of, of story that, that sometimes you, you can't get right if you don't, sometimes you can't get it right if you do have lived experience, right? Like everybody's story is different. Everybody has an individual story to tell, but, um, all I all I have to offer. So wait, is the question if the protagonist is the main character? I mean, if the writer is right, if the, if the, the main protagonist is the main character, and and is, it does uh, feel the protagonist. The question the was specifically about main characters. So so my first instinct is, my question is why? How how come? Like why? I I don't know. I, I just I'm always gonna wonder like what's the for what? Like why why is the main character of color? I, I just, because my whole thing is um, uh, we have secondary and tertiary characters. We have all kinds of, we, we can build out a world, right? It's like, I don't know if the main character needs to be of color because if it's of color, if, if the main character is of color and, and it's inconsequential, right? Which by the way, is something that people argue all the time that like you could just put a black person or a brown person in the story and we don't need to have any cultural cues. Uh, and 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 like it's fine. The truth of the matter is that it's not actually fine because it basically leads into color blindness, right? Uh, which which is nothing actually, but a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a it's a checkbox. So now nobody can say that that book is 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 whitewashed because he'll and and he's my guy to, to be honest. Like I want to make sure that's clear that I do really really like this person. But the truth is is that like he if somebody came to him and was like, "Yo, you you only write whitewashed stories." First of all, he's written a lot of other stuff, but he could say in this particular book like no because the main character is black. And it's like mm, mm, I don't know if that's that doesn't mean the book's not whitewashed. I mean, I I mean, here's another example with Spider-Man and I'm not supposed to ever talk about this stuff, but it is what it is, you know, Spider-Man, when I, the reason I took the Spider-Man gig is because I read the comics and felt like the comics were, that Miles Morales was basically painted brown, was was Peter Parker painted brown. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was, I mean, he's a half black, half Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn. There is no more cultural, culturally textured person than a half black, half Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn, New York. So to eliminate all of those touchstones, to eliminate all those textures 
is wildly violent, right? Like to, to, to a kid who's living in that neighborhood, who's dying to see what a half black, half Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn is like a Spider-Man. And all you see is a kid who basically says, I don't care about my skin color, which is what he, was, what he says in the comic books, which is wild and dangerous and harmful. It's like, well, then what was the, what was the, what was really the, Point. And I'm not saying you have to lean into any sort of cultural stereotypes. I'm just saying you got to do your due diligence, right? Toni Morrison says that it's all about, she believed that it was all about invention and she wanted people to sort of step outside of themselves. I personally am not a person who's going to ever tell somebody what they can and can't write. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm saying swing the bat. If you're going to do it, first of all, mind your own thoughts and ask yourself why, right? Have some intention, first of all. And second of all, if you're going to swing the bat before you do go to bat and practice, work on it, figure, do all your research, figure out how to get this thing as close as possible um, so that when you do put it out, it's solid. I think about Bill Chang, I think the brother's name was. He wrote Southern Cross the Dog and it caused all this kind. He's from Queens. I think he's, I believe he's Korean American from Queens. And it's about old black Southern men, right? In the Mississippi Delta. And he got all this heat because he told the New York Times that he had never even been to the South. And I used to be so upset about it until I talked to one of my mentors and my mentor said, well, Jason, one day you might want to write a book about, uh, you know, Mogadishu. Are you going to go over there? Are you going to, you going to write a book about Vietnam? What if you want to write about the Vietnam War? You weren't there, right? So like, so like there has to, so it's interesting. The, the real question is, did he get it right? And the truth is about that book is he got it right. And all of us were kind of like, well, you know, I wish he would have done. I wish he would have done his due diligence, but he clearly did. He clearly did do his due diligence. He just didn't do what I wanted him to do. But the outcome of the book was fire. James Baldwin, he wrote a white man for his second book, a French white man, and he nailed it. A gay French white man. <laughs> like well, the other thing I'll say well, is Laurel. Sorry, I've got to. I've got to stop you because we're way over time. Uh, sorry, I, wanna, Laurel. I, I want to be respectful. Um, and, and get in one last word from each of you. And, and the question that I tend to ask is what is one project you've dreamed about but haven't started yet? And just briefly as a final thought from each of you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say right now, um, I have this graphic novel that I've been working on for like 15 years. I've done all these books and I've never illustrated one of them, you know? And this one I illustrated and like, you know, it takes cojones to come out there and be like, I'm gonna pitch this book that as a, as a you know, and it's not for kids at all. And it's, uh, will it ever happen? I don't know, um, but, you got, you got a certain amount of time that you're here. And I always tell anybody who like I, I ever have like as a mentee or any, anybody I'm ever teaching, like go to the books that you're most compelled to tell while you're here and tell them. Those are your stories, right? Your voice is like your retina scan, your fingerprint. Your, it's, it's something that's just yours. So like go to your story that you feel like you're most compelled to tell and tell that story. And this is one of them. And people will be like, Samantha who writes about like, you know, like underwear and, and like, and, and, and monsters and otters and like Elmo stuff, like wrote this serious book. Well, I don't care. I don't care what the, the, I'm not writing it for whatever reaction I think or whatever audience I think is going to see it. I'm writing it because it's a book I'm con compelled to tell. How's that? <laughs> Great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, for me, um, the only difference is white people have a different kind of social power. That was the last note to my last uh, answer. Okay, for this answer. <laughs> For this answer, um, I want to write my mom's my mom's story. My mom's story from childhood to around the age of 16 is one of the most fascinating stories I've ever heard in life. And one of these days, I'm going to tell it. I just got to figure out when, because a lot of the people in the story are still alive, and that complicates things. So. Awesome. We can't wait to see that. Laurel? I have one book that I've never been able to begin. I jokingly refer to it as Sexodus. It's, um, it's like a young adult set in the Bible. 
there's a character at the crossing of the Red Sea, there's a character named Nachshon, who's, he's the guy who puts his foot in the water first. Mm. Apparently like the Red Sea doesn't split until somebody sticks their foot in the water, but Nachshon doesn't know how to swim. So it's like this total moment of faith where he's like, all right, I'm like, I'm gonna start walking across the sea. Anyway, but I had, I have this like very lusty young adult sort of storyline mapped against the like blood and sand and sweat of the Bible that I will never write. But it's like, I, it's like the book I dream of. It's like the book I imagine. Like I tell myself the story at that time, but it's just not the kind of thing I'll ever write. <laughs> this book will be banned too. Huh? It's like, it should be like an eighties mini series, you know, like. I'll read that book in a second. And Jason. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you all very much for your time and for your insights and for your willing participation in, in this dialogue. It means a great deal to all of us uh, at Capita, at Air Serenby, Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, and at Hills and Hamlets. And folks uh, who are watching, buy books written by these people and many, many others and, and support your, your independent booksellers as well. So uh, with that, thank you again, and uh, have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Later. Thank you.